Hi, my name is Ira Nabatov. I'm a long-term volunteer here in St. Bernard Parish, which is located directly next to the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans. We are in what I would consider the epicenter of devastation from the aftermath of Katrina. I originally came here for 18 days two years ago this coming Monday on the 7th of January with the intention of working at a relief kitchen for 18 days and returning to my life in New England. By the end of those 18 days, I had connected so strongly with the people of the region here that in good conscience, I just couldn't walk away and say, see you later, let me know how you make out. I went back home and managed to spread some word locally as to what my take on what was going on here was. I came back on the, 4th, on the 14th of February, and at that point I had been part of the kitchen in a way that I was doing community outreach, and I had formerly been part of a community center and kitchen in Keene, New Hampshire, and, and I came to realize that the goodwill and the need were long term, but all of, all of the resources were very temporary. So I vowed to try and uh, connect with locals and see if we could share the vision of starting a community center. And towards that, we started holding community meetings the middle of March 06. And by the middle of April 06, we had formed a local grassroots nonprofit, Community Center St. Bernard, and the ball was rolling. And uh, we filed with the feds about a month later to get our tax exempt status. And it languished on some bureaucrat's desk for about a month and a half. Finally, I enlisted the aid of a congressman's uh, aide and a tax advocate out of the New Orleans office of the IRS, and we managed to get get a phone number and a name of the bureaucrat. And the first question was, you know, uh, we need a reason to expedite this. And we kind of looked around and said, my God, we're in, truly in the epicenter of devastation. If that was ever, you know, if there was ever a compelling reason, one would think that would be it. But of course, that's not quite the uh, how the government works. They needed a compelling reason such as we are in danger of losing our grant, our first grant from the United Way, because we are a United Way partner agency, that we would need our status approved in order to get the grant. Well, that was a reason enough for them to try and expedite. Within two weeks after that, we got our status approved and uh, hit the ground running. We, we almost had a, a warehouse closer to the river that took on very little water. Unfortunately, even though I had an agreement with the owner of the property for the community center, he had listed it with a real estate agent, and he said, well, I gotta pay the guy the commission anyway, go through him. Well, you know, this event has brought out the best in people and the worst in people. The real estate agent chose to set up an appointment with us and a business entity at the same time, which is probably pretty unethical when it comes to how real realtors are supposed to function, but it compelled to start somewhat of a bidding war, which bumped up his commission and fees and pretty much knocked us out of the running for the building. So in late June, early J July of 06, we worked out an agreement with the local Andrew Jackson Lodge and the Masonic Order, and in their effort to give something back to the community, they partnered with us and they gave us this location here. What you see is about between 800 and 1,000 volunteer man hours because this building here took on six feet of water and was only partially gutted when we came on. You know, we had to finish gutting it. We had to clean everything out, tear down the ceiling. We, we had to replumb the bathrooms, hang doors, build the media lab. Like I say, you know, 800, 1,000 volunteer man hours later, we were almost ready to open our door. And, you know, if the electrical contractor had been more engaged, we would have been open the first week in October Unfortunately, you know, the situation was such that we couldn't open our doors until the first week of January 07. So we are actually, in fact, celebrating our first anniversary of opening this month. And, uh, you know, we have many programs, mostly through partners, because we are so undercapitalized and understaffed that, you know, everything we do is you know through our network you know we have legal aid services we have a medical mission bus that comes in uh, you know we, we you know through the musicians clinic we have funding to hire New Orleans musicians to come play for the community here you know we do a lot of things here but you know if not for our partners it would be much more difficult if not impossible 
To see volunteer stories, go to www.projectkatrinavolunteers.net. The decision to protect your vacation investment has become, in the minds of many, a necessity. The grounding of flights after 9-11 or the ravages of a hurricane can make getting to your island getaway or cruise cabin almost impossible. But there are many other perils that insurance can protect a traveler from. It's medical evacuation, lost luggage or passports, or a family member's medical emergency at home. Things that could force a last-minute cancellation. Dan McGinnity of Travel Guard provides an insurance overview. I think travel insurance certainly uh, post 9-11 has become much more on the consciousness of American travelers and, and much more important in today's kind of changing travel landscape. There are so many things that can happen both before you travel and while you're traveling that aren't covered in, in your homeowner's policies, not covered by your health insurance policy, and certainly not covered by your credit card. And a per-trip travel insurance policy that's sold predominantly in the United States is really the peace of mind that allows you to travel freely and, and knowing that, that no matter what happens, you've got some place to turn. Travel insurance is available through a number of distribution channels. Uh, uh, most travel agents uh, offer travel insurance at the point of, point of sale. Uh, it's also available directly through the travel supplier. And with, with the influx of people that are going uh, and buying directly, uh, either from the travel supplier or online, uh, there's companies such as Travel Guard that, that provide it also uh, um, available through online portals. Uh, ours is uh, travelguard.com and there are others where you can go and you can take a look at, at, at the type of travel that you're doing and the type of travel insurance that you need. You know, there, there are a number of reputable travel insurance companies in the United States and most of them belong to an association now called the U.S. Travel Insurance Association. And, and being a member of that association brings with it a certain uh, obligation to meet certain consumer code of conduct and, and e ethics and that the major travel insurance providers in the United States, uh, Access America, Travel Guard, CSA, TravelX, etc., are, are all companies that are going to take care of their customers and, and do so to a very high standard. And uh, um, I, I think that uh, one of the things that you find is that companies like Travel Guard you know, our business is taking care of people when they need assistance. And uh, um, depending on the situation, um, we're, uh, we're there when uh, if a medical emergency occurs and, and you're in a foreign hospital. If they require upfront payment, we'll take care of that. And, and really what we are is, is, is the advocate that's, that's with you wherever you are, anywhere in the world, any time of the day, so that you don't have to worry about all of these potential unforeseen incidents, you, could, you have someone in your corner that will take care of them for you. I think the key things that uh, uh, you need to look for are, first of all, um, uh, what does the policy cover? And whether it's travel insurance or any insurance, the, the two things that you should look for in a travel in, or in an insurance policy are, what are the covered perils, which clearly say, if this happens, you're covered, and what are the exclusions? If this happens, you're not covered. That really is the essence of any insurance policy, be it homeowner's insurance, auto insurance, or travel insurance. And it, it helps get beyond a lot of the other things that kind of, kind of skew your thoughts in terms of, of, of making a decision because uh, in, in essence, that's what you're buying. You're buying, here's what's covered, here's what's not. And that's really an, a simple way to lay out and compare various policies. The good news is if you buy your travel insurance at the time you book your trip, uh, and uh, uh, typically you have a window with Travel Guard, it's 15 days from the time that you buy your trip to purchase the insurance. If you buy your insurance within that, that period, uh, you get two important coverages. You're covered for any pre-existing medical condition, so you don't even have to worry about it. A pre-existing medical condition is some sort of medical condition that you have right now that might uh, uh, prevent you from traveling. Second of all, you're covered for the, uh, the financial default of the travel supplier. So it's another reason. And, and so the, 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 the simple advice is buy your travel insurance when you book your trip and you don't have to worry about pre-existing medical condition exclusions. You don't have to worry about exclusions for financial default. Have you ever wondered if you could survive as a nomad? Rita Golden Gelman left her comfortable suburban home and family and began her nomadic journeys over 20 years ago. On her website, RitaGoldenGelman.com, G 
Gelman blogs about her experiences in unplanned, unguided travel that was exhilarating and sometimes dangerous. During her travels, she became completely immersed in the cultures and lifestyles of her far-flung destinations. Her best-selling book, Tales of a Female Nomad, recounts her travel experiences. Her site highlights interesting books and helpful ideas for travelers looking for a journey like hers. Gelman also has links to traveler blogs with their own insight and advice. And for those with an interest in volunteer work, Gelman offers ways to find travel adventures while doing good deeds. Musicians Village is a virtual project. Uh, it's, it represents an outreach to musicians, a special recruitment area, a special uh, effort to get to inform them of the program and give them the opportunity. Housing is still incredibly important. Home ownership is still incredibly important. But a great need for our city now is affordable housing to bring people back, to get people back in our city so that people can I take the jobs. There's, there's jobs here. It's just finding a place for people to live so that they can then get back and be a part of the workforce. It gives me so much gratification to be able to be here and to also become a homeowner of my own, something that I have been looking forward to for a very long time. I think it's magical that uh, an organization like uh, Habitat is giving us the opportunity to stay in New Orleans. It's such a great feeling to be able to work in my own house, you know, so in other people's houses. I think the whole idea of Habitat to um, uh, give the opportunity. Habitat really has the right program going in that the homeowner has a sense of pride. They come, they work along with us, set sweat equity along with us, they put in their hours, and then they buy their home. This is my fourth day out now. And it makes me feel very proud. Very, you know, it makes me feel wonderful. I can't describe the feeling because <laughs> it's a great feeling. To see volunteer stories, go to www.projectkatrinavolunteers.net. Well, we're on the island of Rhodes and in one of the three ancient cities. Uh, this one is Lindos. And at the top of the 300 stairs we're about to hike is the Acropolis. So since we have 300 stairs to climb, we're going to get hiking, and maybe we'll just tag along with this group that seems to be on their way right now. So we're going to get started. As you can see, the steps are pretty widely spaced, and as I look up, we're literally just getting started here. So I might be a little out of breath as we get closer. Well, I finally got ahead of my camera guy, so I guess it's good that I've been doing a little exercise while here in Greece, because it is a challenging hike, and we're not even a quarter of the way up. Well, we've made it to the base of the Acropolis. Um, we definitely had a chance to catch our breath, because unfortunately, here at the base of the Acropolis, we're told that we can't bring our cameras any further. Now, that doesn't stop you as a consumer or as a travel agent from coming up here with your own uh, personal video camera and filming anything that you want. Um, the way we came about coming to Greece is we decided about seven days ago to bring our cameras here to try to bring this destination to life. Unfortunately, the policies are that unless you go through the bureaucratic process of getting permits and other permissions, you don't have the ability to to film a beautiful destination and a beautiful, uh, a beautiful site like the Acropolis here in Lindos. What we are going to do is we're going to leave our camera down here with the folks that won't let us take it any further. We're going to bring our still camera and we're going to do our best to bring this little destination, this little piece of paradise to life for you.
mentally prepared myself for destruction. What I didn't prepare for was the emotional toll of hearing people's stories. I'm 80 years old. I was born in 1925. My biggest regret is that I have to practically start all over. I've lost everything. Furniture, clothing, bedding, uh, none of it is usable. I couldn't even use the furniture for kindling wood to start a campfire. The homeowners were really everyone from a fairly young adult couple with a new baby who've really lost their whole home through seniors, members of the Jewish community, members of the non-Jewish community, various neighborhoods from neighborhoods that took maybe six or eight inches of water to homes that were under nine feet of water. We did everything from like yard work to you know just completely gutting homes, taking out carpet, removing furniture. Oh, oh have, this uh, is my wedding announcement. No wonder I had that one yeah. stuck out. <laughs> Been married for 45 years wow. and in you this house for 43. Do you know where Not only did they clean homes and help with community organizations like synagogues, but they came down and listened to people. They, they allowed people to grieve and that's probably the most important thing that our volunteers did. Some of my Hadassah pins, girls. Uh, I'm finding a lot of Hadassah things in good shape. Yeah, life member pins. <laughs>destruction here that it sort of overwhelms you and you almost become numb to it. Be prepared that you cannot know what's coming, what you're going to see, um, and be open to that and be open to the emotions that that's going to produce. In the midst of all this destruction, there was this pink headband and it just, it was so, it just struck me because it, you know that it's sitting there because it belongs to someone, because it belongs to a little girl. And the first thing she said to me, she said, oh mommy, look at that. She said, that's some little girl's headband. And it makes you wonder like, is that person okay? Are they going to be okay? So. Everything they had was just left the way that it was and their belongings were strewn on the street. I'm here because I have a responsibility to the world. I have a responsibility to rebuild the world, to perfect the world, to try and make it a better place. Not only do we help individuals, but also the community at large. For example, Congregation Beth Israel, which was the synagogue that suffered the most hurricane-related damage. Beth Israel is New Orleans only modern Orthodox synagogue and they really had nothing left there. It was completely destroyed and it was in just such disarray. It was under nine feet of water for close to a month so nearly every home in that neighborhood has been absolutely destroyed. We took down all the yurt site plaques and some of them went back from like 1912 um, and we literally took each plaque down and those are the only things that the synagogue really has left. That's really their only memory of who was there and their history. If we don't have businesses, we don't have jobs. And if we don't have jobs, we don't have people. If we don't have people, we don't have a city. One of the byproducts of the volunteers coming down here is when they're here, they're spending money, they're supporting the local economy, and they're sustaining local business. One day we took everybody to a kosher restaurant and the other day that we catered in from a kosher deli so that we were able to support New Orleans kosher businesses, which I think is very important because both businesses have just recently reopened after gutting their buildings. This experience has been life-changing. I want people to realize that it's still going on, that these people still need help. They still need help rebuilding their lives. They still need help finding jobs. Here, you know, you have an opportunity to make history. You're part of history, and you can really make an impact. I can now go back with stories, and I can teach my students and speak to my family and my community and tell them what I see and tell them what I, what I saw and what I did. Who do you turn to? When your donors have lost everything, who do you turn to when your donors have become your clients, basically? And I think the answer is they turn to us. They turn to the American Jewish community, to the world Jewish community,
because that's what the Jewish community is about. It's about Kol Yisrael Arivim Zelazet. It's about all of Israel taking care, being responsible one for another. And we have to be there for them because they need us right now. How do you thank people for putting people's lives back together box by box? You can't. The fact that when I picked this book up, and it's all pretty molded and stuck together, but the only page that opened up was something that reads, to see the world anew. And I think what it means is that they've been through so much devastation here and their homes are completely, completely ruined, but that sometime again, the world will be anew. And, and with everything that goes bad, there'll always be something good that will come out of it, we hope. And good things to look forward to. And that's what life's about. Communication was gone, cell phones died, nothing worked. Without the ham radios, we were not able to um, communicate with our shelters because the phone lines are down. We weren't able to communicate with our other resources like FEMA and MEMA and the Office of Emergency Management. With no communication whatsoever, with all the systems down, uh, it was very important to Dr. O'Brien. Communications are extremely fragile and that tends to be our biggest issue. As soon as the wind died down just a little, I was up stringing antennas up on the roof. I immediately began to pass uh, uh, emergency traffic physicians, uh, nurses, uh, any state, bring your license. Uh, we need medical supplies, additional vaccines, uh, techniques. I was handling HF traffic, emergency traffic, and a lot of it. There were uh, requests for rescue, there were still people trapped uh, in dormitories at some of the universities in, uh, in New Orleans. Um, I handled a lot of uh, emergency traffic there. And, uh, tough. That's a, uh, let's face it, this is the greatest natural disaster we've had in the United States. It's really been an experience for me and uh, I'm glad to help. I wound up uh, setting up in a uh, Walmart parking lot. I was receiving uh, traffic over the HF net, a lot of uh, search and rescue, people trapped in attics, uh, uh, people trapped on roofs. There was a woman in labor with serious complications and uh, she was not going to make it if she didn't get out. They couldn't get a helicopter into that hospital. But, uh, the helicopter got into Tulane Hospital and then they had a boat en route to uh, pick her up and uh, we had her ready to go and, uh, and getting in the boat. She got out uh, safely and got into the chopper. That, that was a, a real heartwarming experience. Because I am from New Orleans, this region is a very deep and super important part of who I am. I had to do something. This is my first emergency as a ham radio operator. We put up an antenna at the Red Cross headquarters in Brookhaven, set them up with a radio base moved down to Gulfport, did some work there, slept in a school. It's better than sitting home and watching it on TV. It's very difficult for me because I'm from New Orleans. I went ahead and got my ticket after 9-11 because I, I wanted to be of some use. I, I love the idea of talking on the radio to people on the other side of the planet who you, you've never seen. And, um, and so I, I did it so that I would be of use. And it's paid off. It's really paid off. Such a relief to myself and Dr. Mala and Dr. Brian to have have Mike and uh, all those people out there that help to communicate with him. Uh, it's definitely a, a definite warm, uh, heartfelt thank you from from me and from our staff. Without the ham operators, we really don't have a way to communicate. 
And I'd like to say to the ham operators that helped us with this hurricane that they have been a wonderful asset. They've always had a smile on their face, they work really long, hard hours, and they were there to support us in every way that they could. So I say a heartfelt thank you from the shelter members, from the staff, and also from the Red Cross. Cell phones, landline telephones, internet, email. Outside of that, what is there? I mean, if it's all down, it's down, and you know, can't get at the airwaves via the ham operators, and you got there's no communication. Thanks, guys. Myself personally and the Red Cross truly, truly, truly offers their complete and wholehearted thanks. I think the American people offer their thanks in that the people in this area are really appreciative of what their efforts are because from what I understand, you're all doing this as full volunteers, no recompense, you're paying your own way, um, and that goes really above and beyond anything that I have known before. So a very wonderful, heartfelt thanks and keep coming back. And if there's anything that we can do for you guys, let us know.